So, and there are tons more examples. Um, you know, if you're in the slides, you can kick, uh, you can copy this link to look at um, the shiny showcase um, where there are all sorts of you know super complicated uh, fancy examples along with some more simple examples that sort of are there to help you learn more about how to use shiny by example. So what's the point of learning shiny? I can make these plots. I, I you know I know a little bit of R. I can make a plot. I can change the, the values if I want. So I thought um, I might clarify that by sharing my reason for learning Shiny. So I'm a computational biology researcher and um, I work a lot with um, biologists who are my collaborators who uh, really want to analyze a lot of large data sets, but uh, don't necessarily uh, have a great way to do that. So for example, my collaborators uh, might have this data set that has 20,000 genes and those genes are recorded across 10,000 samples. And this is too big for them to look at um, in Excel in a meaningful way. And they are really interested in plotting you know, one specific gene um, of interest, maybe the expression across the samples. And so they tell me that, they tell me what gene they want, uh, I get the data set, and then I can make them whatever plot they want for gene X. So this is totally fine um, if they care about one to two genes or if they have you know, a list of genes that they know that they want today. However, if somebody, if a group just wants to explore a data set, it often happens that um, you know, today they'll send me a couple genes, you know, next week they'll send me a few more genes and it's a lot of emails back and forth, them sending me genes, me sending them plots, and it can get a little bit crazy with the cycle. So, uh, you know, in order to break this cycle, I'm not really that Im important when it comes to the to the data exploration, um, especially if the um, if the topic isn't really in my expertise. So what I want to do is take myself out of that cycle, and I want to build a shiny app for my collaborators that puts them in between the data and the visualization or the other outputs um, that they want so that I can just set up a system and then they can go to town looking for as many genes um, as they desire without having to worry about sending me an email every time um, they want something new. And so you can imagine, um, you know, in other cases, I think a lot of you are probably grad students according to, um, according to our polls, that instead of collaborators, this might be your boss, this might be your PI or mentor, and you have a big data set, maybe your PI you know, isn't an R user, but they want to be able to explore your data sets. You could make them a shiny app, um, share it with them, and they can look at the plots instead of, you know, every minute sending you an email about what plot they want to look at. Or you can do it together, just a really nice way. Um, in, you know, non-academia, uh, these are your, share your stakeholders. These are your bosses. These are other people um, in your company who aren't um, used to using data, who also, you know, you don't want to be the gatekeeper um, to seeing these data. And so building these shiny apps can um, really help sort of break out of that role of gatekeeper, data gatekeeper. You don't want to be that. So what are we going to learn today? Um, basically, what I'm going over today is a distilled version of uh, the first um, set, uh, the first lecture in the um, R Studio Shiny tutorial, um, along with uh, an example of you know what I sort of the steps I went through to build my first app after after learning this step. So you'll learn how to build a simple Shiny app, and that's um, Creating by creating interactions um, between the input user and the app that you build. And then um, at the very end, I'll show you um, how it's relatively easy to uh, share your apps um, on the web so that anyone with the link um, can take a look at them rather than your app just living in our studio, which is where most of our examples will live today. And so, like I said, this workshop was inspired by the our studio shiny tutorial. You can find that here. Um, it's excellent. Um, I've gone through almost almost all of it, and it just makes me really want to learn even more. And uh, I threw it in the I threw it in the chat, and if you have the slides, you can get this link. But if you want to follow along with the some of the coding examples that I'm using in the uh, in the beginning today, 
just pop over to the um, Shiny Tutorial GitHub and just, you know, uh, clone the Git, download, download the zip and uh, pop into those folders and the, the coding examples are all in there. Okay. So to get started, the first thing that we need to do um, is understand the architecture of a Shiny app. So the secret is that every Shiny app is maintained by a computer running R. Uh, before you put it, on, put it on the web, your Shiny apps are just gonna live on your laptop. And so basically what we have is a laptop that talks to some sort of user interface that looks like a web page. It is a web page. And then uh, the user inputs into the um, user interface and that information goes back to the computer and then the computer makes you a new plot and so on and so forth. Um, like I said, right now, we're just running apps on our laptop, but um, at the end, I'll show you how to um, get your Shiny app on a server, um, which is another version of the computer um, that's running the R code behind your Shiny app. Um, and that's how they can be uh, disseminated to the broader public and not just live on your computer by, by themselves. So given that um, the uh, Shiny app needs to live in a computer and connect to uh, a user interface, that sort of dictates what Shiny code consists of. So there are two major parts of the Shiny code. The first um, is the instructions to build this user interface. And this says HTML here, which is scary because I don't know HTML, but basically what this part of the R code is doing is writing HTML for you. So you're gonna use R scripts and R functions to generate the HTML that will make this web page. The server instructions are um, telling the user interface what to plot. So um, inside the server uh, instructions, we are saying, hey, I wanna plot a scatter plot with all of these points from this data on here. So um, when I'm talking about the server, I'm referring to the server instructions. If I'm talking about the UI, then I'm talking about the user interface instructions. Um, this will hopefully become more clear in a second, but please stop me if you have any questions. Okay, I think the best thing that I learned from the Shiny tutorial is that every Shiny app can start with this template. I'm just gonna save this template forever and open it and copy paste it into a new, um, into a new uh, R file whenever I want to make a Shiny app. And honestly, this uh, this app will run this just the template ad. This is the simplest version um, of a Shiny app. So I can show you that. Um, if you can see my, uh oh, our studio poster. Zoom in. So that's probably, oh no, that's too big. I'm old, not that old. Okay, so uh, this is, just our um, simplest Shiny app that we can run. So when you open um, a Shiny app, um, our studio automatically knows that this is code for a Shiny app. And you're gonna get this um, little icon at the top that says run app. So you can choose whether you want the app to run in your viewer pane in our studio or whether you want it to pop up in a separate window. And you know, as soon as you have everything going, you can just push run app. Uh, it's going to run this run app function and it's going to open something in your viewer. Uh, so this is our app. It doesn't have anything in it because there's nothing in the user interface or in the server, but it's running the app because this is the base architecture that you need to run your app. Okay, so that's boring, but necessary. So like I said, the UI generates, generates the HTML for the user interface and the server functions are going to tell your computer what to do with the input information that your user gives um, to create some sort of output, like a plot or a table. So the idea here is that we're going to build our apps around inputs and outputs. So the first thing we're going to talk about are um, these input functions. 
and then we have output functions that make the plots. So we can add various inputs and outputs to our user interface um, with the input and output functions. So um, I'll show you some examples in a bit, but in the user interface, we're basically just making space um, for uh, areas that we want people to input information and areas that we want to show some sort of output. So in the um, example app from Shiny, it sort of looks like this. We have um, a histogram, you use a slider to choose uh, a number and uh, it's going to sample that many numbers of value, that many number of values from a normal distribution and plot it. So our input here is the user choosing a number that we're going to call num um, with the slider bar. And the output is a histogram plotting num number of values selected from a normal distribution. So the non-app version um, might look like this, where you have num and you can set it equal to whatever you want. And then num is going to make the examples. Or num is going to plot the histograms. If you look here, this is kind of like you know what I'm used to doing in R. So here we'd go to plots. Uh, we have our num plot. We're going to run this. Uh oh. Should probably set this first. All right. And then the only way that we can really update this is by going in and changing by hand this num number and rerunning it and rerunning the histogram. So this isn't really, you know, you can't interact with this plot to change it. You have to go into the R code to, to get it to change. Okay. So instead, let's build the app version of that R code. So what we're gonna start with are a bunch of, uh, R is an input function. And so as you might be able to uh, tell from this slide, we have uh, several different options. These are just examples. And in our histogram example, oh, sorry, in the uh, k-means clustering example that we showed before with the iris data set, um, they use the numeric input, so you could set your number of clusters, and they use the select box input so that you could choose um, what features you wanted to plot from the data set. I know, Barat. In, the, um, in this uh, histogram example, we're going to use this slider input function so we can put in a slider. So let's just look at the syntax before I open the code back up again. Um, we, for these input functions, we use the function slider input. We have to give it an ID, um, which seems kind of arbitrary, but is really important for connecting um, the user um, interface with the server functions, what we're actually gonna do with these numbers. And then it's pretty straightforward. You put a little label, this one is choose a number, and then uh, you know it makes the label there. So if we go look, Go look at our template here. Here's our UI function. So the first function that we use in UI is this fluid. Really, you're sending things in your UI to a function called fluid page that just builds your page. So everything has to live inside fluid page. And so um, the next thing that we'll want to put in is this slider input input function. So Slider input, yes, Shiny, thank you for your suggestion. And then the um, input ID, which we're going to call num. Uh, our label. Number. And then we have some other stuff. So uh, for example, we're, we're gonna pick a, a starting value under value um, and it's gonna be 25. And then um, min is, uh, so values are starting value. It's gonna be the default. Our min value is one and our max value is 100. And I found um, that just, there are a lot of 
I've learned a lot of new functions recently just going into the yeah, help panel to get my um, input has been really useful. So like I just mixed up min, max, and value. Uh, I can say, oh, right, value is just the initial value on the slider, cool. Okay, so now we've got something going on in our thing. Let's see what happens when we run our app. Let's go back to the viewer and we'll click run up. Oh, I'm gonna save that that I changed. Okay, cool. So now in our app, instead of just having a blank page, we have our slider bar. And it's not just a picture, I can slide around this bar, pretty sweet, uh, but it's not contributing <laughs> to anything. We don't have a plot, we don't have anything going on. So we gotta tell our user interface um, what outputs we want. Okay. Oh, you know. And so that comes with the output functions. And so what output functions you use are going to depend on what sort of output you want. So um, it makes sort of sense. If you want some sort of interactive data table, you use this one. Um, if you want a text output, you use text output. Uh, but obviously, since we're making, uh, trying to make these histograms today, we're going to be using, um, in this example, the plot output function. And so all these output functions are, are pretty similar. You're going to add it to fluid page, just like the input function. Um, and all you're going to do is put the name of um, what you want the object to be named. So we're going to add a plot called hist to our output function. OK, so these guys have to be separated by commas. Oh, come on. And we're going to say um, plot output. And then uh, we want our plot to be called. And by called, I mean, it's an, it's an internal call. Nothing um, that you put in plot output is going to show up as text on your screen. This is just what we're going to refer to our histogram as, because we're going to need to tell, uh, to refer to this in our server function. Okay, when you're when you want to start, you have to actually tell R to stop your app. I keep being confused about that. <laughs> All right, and so let's run the updated app. Okay, that's cool. We added plot output, but nothing is actually happening, um, which is you know a little bit disappointing. But I'll uh, I will explain. So. What's happening when you use these output functions within the user interface is that the output function isn't really doing anything concrete. You haven't told the computer to do anything. You haven't put in the script to make a histogram. It doesn't know what to do. What it is doing is adding space um, in the user interface, so in your actual website, um, for the R object. So that is the new dedicated space where your plot is going to live. So it doesn't show up when we, uh, when we run the app, but it's there. And you have to build the object, the actual object that you want to plot in the server function. It's really important that you need both of these things, a place for your plot to go and then code uh, to actually build the plot. And that goes in the server function. Okay, do we have any questions about um, the user interface before I uh, move on? All right, I'll keep trucking. Okay, so now we need to tell the server how to assemble inputs from our slider into outputs in the form of a plot. And so, we got to answer the question, how is the server even talking to our user interface? So like I said, the user interface um, object, we're making space for this plot. And in the server function, um, we're going to save um, the objects that we actually want to display um, in this object called output. And this can always be the same. Um, our server function has input, we have output. I think you can name it whatever you want. This is typical. And so what we're gonna do is uh, make a little object called output dollar sign hist. It's sort of like putting um, this in a slot. 
And anything that you put after um, this hiss, the code output hiss, the code that goes there is going to show up um, in your plot output in the user interface. Oh, yeah. Okay, so code is where you're going to uh, put the code to make your histogram. Um, what goes after that dollar sign needs to match the name given um, given to the output function in the user interface. That's how they talk to each other. So it doesn't matter what you call these. I could call it, you know, my fat cat. Um, and as long as I know that that's a histogram and I call this my fat cat and I call this my fat cat, then they're going to know to talk to each other. Okay. Um, unfortunately, we can't just um, type in, you know, hist our norm. We uh, have to use another function that um, tells the server to render the plot and send it to the user interface. And these are called the render functions. Sorry. And um, in this case, we're going to use render plot because we want to make a plot. So that kind of makes sense. But there are lots of different render functions. Um, and they'll match out with your with your output functions. If you're wanting to output text, you'll put render text. If you're doing output table, you'll use render table, um, so on and so forth. And so basically what this is doing is building a reactive output to display in your user interface. So um, where first you'll do render plot, which tells the type of object to build. And then we're going to put the code block inside that actually builds the object. So if we go back to our studio, we can add to our server function exactly what they had um, on the slide, which is going to be output. Yes, because we need to use the same thing that we called it up here. And then we're going to make a plot. So we're going to use render plot. Uh, and then you're making this a whole code block. So you need your um, parentheses and your brackets. I think that's just part of the syntax. And then what they have here is hist, uh, which is our histogram function, just base r, our norm, and uh, 100. So this is going to uh, select uh, 100 values from a normal distribution and plot it in a histogram. All right, so let's stop our old app. Let's save this and run here. Okay, so now you can see that we have a, oh, I can't really see the histogram, it's too big. Come on. Now you can see uh, the histogram that gets plotted in our viewer, but you can see that still, you know, our slider is totally unconnected from our histogram. I can move this around however I want, and it's not making any difference to what's happening with the plot. And that's because in our code here, we have this 100, and we're not actually referring to anything that has to do with the slider bar. How do we do that? OK, so how does the server function get information um, from the user interface and, and vice versa? So in the user interface object, you've already given, we've already given our input value an ID. So in the slider function, we have this input ID that's num. And so analogously to those output functions, um, we're going to specify our input here um, with input dollar sign and um, whatever you know, ID we gave what we want our slider input to be, which in this case is num. So now input num is gonna change anytime your user slides that slider bar. And just like I said, what goes after this dollar sign needs to match the ID uh, given to the analogous input. So we haven't built a shiny app yet, but almost. So here, instead of 100, I'm going to change this to input dollar sign num, because that's what we named it up here. I'm going to save it. I'm going to stop this. 
I'm gonna run it again. So now, instead of having just that static histogram with a slider bar that doesn't mean anything, every time I change the slider bar, I get a different plot because we're randomly resetting our, our norm um, and selecting a different number of values to pull from a normal distribution. So congrats, if you're following along the code with me, you built your very first um, very simple Shiny app. Um, sorry, I gotta find my, oh no. Sorry, my monitor disconnected. Should be back in a sec. <laughs> sorry about that, you guys. Okay, I'm gonna have to stop share and pull this back onto my my primary laptop. Sorry about that. Okay. Again, sorry about that. Okay, so now congrats. Um, we've built a Shiny app. It's really that easy. Now you can at least make a slider bar and put in a histogram. But uh, I'd like to, I don't know if it'll be helpful, but I'd really like to walk you through uh, an example of my, how I built my first app this week. All right. So like I said, um, the goal for my first app was just sort of pull myself out of um, this loop so I can let uh, my non R using collaborators explore the data that they're interested in um, on their own. And so the first thing that you have to do um, to save your app for sharing is uh, put everything that, make a new directory and put everything that your app is gonna need in that directory. The other most important thing is that if you want to share this with shiny.o, you have to use the name app.r for your app. That's how um, the Shiny server uh, recognizes uh, the app as an app. So, sorry, now I got too much going on. So I went to uh, my very organized desktop. I got my um, working out of this shiny app thing and I made a folder called my first app. And um, I've got some data that I know I wanna use uh, for my app, this uh, Drosophila RNA-seq data. Uh, this RS Connect, I'll show you later, it gets generated um, when you post your app to the internet. And then I just have a source folder that has some of the, the functions that I've written that I want to use um, in my app. And then, okay. So that is the first thing. Sorry about this guys, I'm just a little disheveled with my monitor getting disconnected. Okay, okay. So. We're gonna start uh, with that same template. So like I said, I'm just copy pasting stuff over from that template into here. We've got our empty fluid page user interface and our uh, empty server function. And then this sort of obligatory um, loading shiny and putting this shiny app server equals server UI equals UI at the bottom. 
The next thing I want to do is make a plan. So what do I need to have in my user interface for my new app? So I'm interested in um, a box for users to type in a specific gene name from the data set. And then I want a space to display a plot that shows the expression of that gene in different conditions. And I want a space for a table that's going to um, display the number of samples in each condition that this gene is expressed in. And so the example input functions that I think I'm going to be interested in here are mo mostly this text input, because really my app only needs one input, a gene name. And then for output, um, we're, again, we're going to use the plot output, um, just like in the old app. I'm also going to add this table output um, function so I can get that table going. Sorry, guys. So um, the first thing we want is um, a box for users to type in the gene name. So we're going to put input. Now I get my cheat notes. So we're going to do, oh yeah, text input. And this text input one has um, a couple different things uh, going on. So we need the input ID. We're just going to call that gene. And then what else do we need? Label for the box. And we're going to put that just for the gene. And then there are a couple of different things that you can do here that um, I discovered. One of them is go to help. Um, so you can either enter in an initial value. So that would just be a random gene that I choose that'll populate um, with the graph and stuff right when you open up the graph. Or instead of doing that, you can type in um, a placeholder which is a character string that lives in the text box that just says something generic um, like type your gene symbol of interest here. Okay. So if we do that and we go to the viewer and we hit run app, we're getting a bunch of errors. You just need the equal oh, sign. Thanks, Galen. Yeah. All right, so now we got our box. It says type with the gene symbol of interest here and I can do whatever I want, um, but nothing is going to happen because nothing else is going on. So next we need to, I'll talk about this submit button um, later. But next we're going to um, make our place to display a plot. So it'll be plot input, just like before. And all we have to do here, just like hist, is um, give our plot a name and I'm gonna call it VLN because the type of plots that I'm making are violin plots. Um, we're gonna put a comma after this. We're gonna put a comma after this. And then, um, a new thing is that we want to display a, a table, just a static table. So I'll do table. Input, is that right? Oh, table output, whoops. You guys, that's how you know you're learning. We want to output a plot. We don't want to input a plot. That doesn't make sense. Put, and we're just going to put a guy called tab here. Yep. Okay. 
So just like before, you put table input. You only oh. fix the plot input one. So just like before, um, we still have our text input panel and we don't have anything showing up for our plot output and our table output, but in the background, um, our user interface has made space for that. So that's what we need to do there. Cool. Okay. So the next thing we need to do is plan what we're going to do with our server function. So we already know that we're, we've got this text input, we want a plot to come out, and we want a table to come out. So again, our input needs to be um, some sort of gene name. I want to output um, a violin plot that shows the gene expression, and I want to uh, output a table with some other information. And so to make this work, just like um, with the histogram example, we're going to use the render function. Um, again, we're going to use render plot to make that violin plot, and we're going to use the new function render table to get our table in there. Okay. So, the first thing we need to do is make our um, object that says uh, where we're going to. Uh, where the information is going to go to the output. And so for our violin plot, that needs to be called VLN. So it knows what to do. And then we're going to go uh, plot. And then we just need some code uh, for our plot. And the cool thing I think about Shiny apps is that I already have code for these because I've already been doing this one gene or a few genes at a time for my collaborators. And so I'm just going to grab this code that I've already been using and plop it in here. And this isn't really that important to understand for the exercise, but um, this is just a function from a package called Surat that takes some data. And then um, the features that it wants are your uh, the gene that you're interested in, and then it, it makes the plot for you. So a couple things need to go on here. First of all, this GOI is from my old code. Uh, before, it would I would just set something up, you know, outside that said GOI equals this gene that my collaborators care about, RBF, and then violin plot would know to look for the gene expression of RBF. But that's a very static way of doing it. Um, how we want to get information from this input. So how do we do that? And um, it's pretty easy, just like we're doing um, output violin, or just like in the previous example where we did input num. Now we're going to do input. And it's going to be the uh, input ID from our text input field from the user interface. So that's going to be whatever they type in here. Nice. All right. So the other thing we have to think about here is this uh, violin plot function um, comes from, um, like I said, a package called Surat. And so I got to make sure that my Shiny app is loading that package. So it's not going to read my mind, unfortunately. Similarly, similarly, our next, um, the table that I want to make um, gets generated by um, a custom function that um, I've written. And that lives in um, a document in the source folder. And so I have a source folder that holds some of my custom functions for this project um, called scrnatesseedfunctions.r. So we got to make sure that it has everything it needs to load that. Um, and it also is going to need diverse. And so this isn't, none of this is, uh, you know, shiny specific. This is just making sure 
that um, the code that you run inside of your Shiny app has all the resources it needs um, to run. And I forgot to do this the first time that I tried to build this app and was, was very confused. <laughs> so next we wanna output um, our table. And here we don't need commas um, for the server function, but we need to do output. <coughs> tab from up here. And then again, we're going to use a render function, but this time it's render table. And we're going to make a code chunk with our brackets. And then um, I have um, a little custom function called um, end cells tab, very creative. And I'm just going to pop in here. And again, we're not going to use our boring static uh, GOI, we're going to change this to input gene. So the one thing that I haven't put in is um, this data. So this is the um, data that I want my plots and tables to be generated from. And uh, that's pretty straightforward. Just like you're writing any other car R code, you can load it straight away um, just outside of the, um, of the UI or the server. So I'm just going to copy this in because it's boring. Um, loading the data I want to use. And again, this data, you know, while you don't have to load it into the UI um, or the server function, it does have to live in the same um, in the same folder with your app so that um, your app knows where to find it when you upload it to the cloud. And then this is just some, uh, again, some Surat specific um, code that I need for the data. Okay, so let's see what's going on now. Not open connector and why? No source, that's the RNAC function dot R, come on. Definitely there. Who's that? Source. Let's see any functions. There was set WD in your code up top too. Ah, separate fluid image. Oh, no, I meant like you threw an extra set after like fluid page, you set oh. it in there instead of the console. So it's going to screw you up later when you try to run up a little. Ten, line 10. Where is it? Line 10. Oh. Yeah, see that set WD? Yeah, yeah. It just <laughs> got thrown in while you were typing in the console. Sorry, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Sorry about this, guys. I don't know why it's not finding that. I would maybe try throwing set WD in the. Yeah, maybe it doesn't. Just work. see if it. <laughs> Shouldn't have to do this, though. Right. Or I guess put the full path. Yeah. In source. One or the other. Okay. It likes that. Oh. Wow. Cool. So right now it's saying we haven't found any of your requested variables. But that's because we haven't requested a variable yet, right? So <laughs> that makes sense. It can't plot nothing. So let's put in our uh, gene of interest RBF. And you can see that uh, miraculously we're getting um, a plot here. It's a violin plot. It looks just like I hoped it would. And then at the bottom here, um, you get a nice table. And uh, this is cool. The reason why it's good to use fluid page is because you can you can do this. You can resize things as you resize things resize as you resize your window. There's also an option um, to use static page, but from what I've read, nobody really um, uses that very often. Um, so, and that way all of your objects can put them in the stay the same size regardless of the size of the window. Um, the thing that's kind of annoying to me is that every time I'm 
typing out uh, a gene or I delete it or I'm trying to uh, find a new gene, it's like freaking out with that, um, with that error message. And so I was wondering if there was a way that I could, um, you know, put a pause on the, uh, on the app making the graph until I'm done typing in the gene name and hit something like a, a submit button. So that's what I looked into next. So basically what I wanna know is can I prevent the graph and table from updating until the user hits a random submit button? And there's a pretty easy way to do this. Um, it's, uh, you can add what's called an action button into your user interface. Um, so if you put in something like this, action button submit, then you just literally get a little button in your app that looks like this. But uh, what you have to do to the server is a little bit more um, involved. So now um, what we're going to do is um, make a reactive event. So uh, basically this function um, event reactive delays reaction until our action button is clicked. And so event reactive um, knows when we get uh, interaction with this input um, submit object, and then uh, it's going to um, update then input gene, and it's gonna output that to a new thing called gene name. So this is a little bit confusing to me, especially because gene name isn't an object, um, it's actually a function. So event reaction, uh, event reactive um, takes this sort of action input and um, then it makes a function called that I'm calling gene name. And basically uh, once someone hits submit, my gene name, the input gene is going to populate this gene name function. And then, um, and then the graph is gonna get um, updated, the graph and table. So let's see what that looks like. And I mean, obviously the app um, works without this, there are just a, a million little things like this that you can do um, to update. So I'm gonna copy in this submit button. So we have this, again, action button. Um, everything needs an ID so we can call it up in the server. So we're calling it submit. Then we have um, our label, which is just what the button's going to say. And then, We're going to use event reactive. Um, the input, the first thing that you want to put in event reactive is uh, what you want um, your uh, what you want to react to, and in this case, it's clicking the submit button. And then um, once the submit button is clicked, it's going to change uh, the input gene object, and uh, then gene name is going to be populated by input gene. And so now instead of our plots and tables re uh, reacting to input gene, we have to replace it with this new reactive, uh, reactive object gene name, which you have to put parentheses after because it's actually a function. So we're gonna change that here too. We're gonna save it. We're gonna stop our initial thing, run the app again. And so now you can see that um, we get this cute submit button here. I'm still getting an error at the bottom, which I'm not quite sure what it's about, but the app works otherwise. So now you can see it's not trying to do anything as I'm typing in. I can type in something crazy. It's not trying to make a, it's not trying to make an app, but doesn't do anything until I hit submit. And then again, we get these, our same graph and table. And when I delete, it's not confused because it has no input. It's just holding on to that RBF because we haven't typed anything new. We haven't hit the submit button. So until we hit the submit button, it's gonna hold on to the um, original thing that, that we typed in. So now I can do a new one. And again, nothing's gonna happen until I hit the submit button. And so it sort of takes away that annoying 
you know, you have no input, we don't know what to do uh, message at the beginning. Okay. So, um, Congratulations to us. We, I just showed you how to build another app. I built my first app. We have another app complete. That being said, it still lives on my computer. If the point is for my collaborators uh, to be able to interact with it, we haven't really accomplished that goal. So how can I share my app? I thought this was gonna be really hard, but it ended up being relatively straightforward. So all you have to do is use this already pre-approved uh, pre-made pre um, server for Shiny Apps that our studio hosts called shinyapps.io. And um, shinyapps.io, it's, it's pretty good. Um, the initial option, it's free, it's uh, easy to use. I posted my app today and only took two tries. <laughs> um, and uh, evidently it's secure and it's scalable. Okay. So um, getting started, you actually need to upload another package. So the uh, stuff I'm showing here is from their um, Shiny Apps uh, HTML just article for getting started. So if you wanna follow along, you can do that. Um, you have to install another package called um, RS Connect. And RS Connect is what lets your computer talk to um, the uh, shiny.io server. And so basically you make an, you uh, make an account, um, you choose a, a name for your account, sort of like normal, then it's gonna generate this code um, with this um, token and then um, a, another secret code uh, that you have to put in, I guess that helps with the security. So uh, first you have to click the show secret button. It doesn't work if you've just put in secret, which is one thing that I, <laughs> that I found out. So you click the show secret button, you copy in this code into your R console. And uh, then once that's done, uh, you're gonna connect to, uh, you're gonna do library RS connect. You're gonna use their deploy app function uh, and you're just gonna input the path to the new app. And then um, it takes a couple minutes, depending on what's in there, but then it shows up um, here in, oh, that's not it. it shows up um, within your Shiny account. So if we just go to shiny.io, I have, that's not right. Sorry. Shiny apps.io is the actual thing. So we can do this later, but if you log in, you get um, a cute little thing that uh, just houses your apps. I don't know why I can't. Anyway, um, you get an account, um, your apps will show up in that account and then you'll be able to launch them. So if we go here and we just click on the link, hopefully it'll redirect to my app on the internet. And it still has this error that's occurred that I don't know what that's about, but it doesn't matter. I should just make a message that says, please ignore the error. Submit. And now anyone can use this data set to make um, violin plots and, um, and a table showing the percent of cells in any particular cell type expressing um, our gene of interest. And so I feel like this is pretty successful. This is something I could shoot over um, to my collaborators that um, they could use. And I feel like I'm being a better collaborator and a better data scientist by, uh, you know, sort of taking myself uh, out of that equation. So one other thing, um, that I learned today. So when you post your app, like I said, you get this new folder called RS Connect. And I actually had to take my um, app down 
because um, the data set that I had uploaded was too large. So I needed to take a subsample of, um, of that uh, to replace. And so I deleted my app on the website, but then I couldn't, um, I couldn't re-upload my app and evidently, um, before you can do that, you have to delete all of this RS Connect um, info and, and from your directory um, and start over. And once I did that, it was totally fine. Um, but I guess the other thing is, it is that I learned is that um, it's really important um, to understand sort of the data limitations. Uh, and we can talk about that in the next slides. Limitations of free shiny IO. Okay, so these are the shiny.io options. Um, it would be awesome if we could just do however many apps we wanted um, for, for free, but un unfortunately, they don't want to just give away free server space <laughs> um, for too many people. So this only hosts. Um, five applications and unfortunately it seems like you can only load up to like one gig um, of stuff on there and you uh, also get limited memory so I think that for large you actually get like one gig of memory so my app wouldn't even run um, I wouldn't be able to upload the full data set um, at all because I wouldn't be getting enough um, space and then even with a subsampled version initially um, I wasn't able to run, so I had to subsample um, again. So I think if I, if you know, you really are wanting to use this for a ton of apps with a lot of big data, you definitely have to. It looks like you have to upgrade. So uh, there's a basic. This is all pretty expensive, which was kind of disappointing. And then there's a professional one where you get like you know a bajillion active hours and lots of users and and blah 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 for if you're a company, which I think would be super ideal. Um, but in academia, we don't like to spend any money to do anything. So, uh, you know, it's a little, little disappointing. That being said, you can build your very own server, which is free instead of um, hosting on their server. I mean, free, you need to have a computer and things to host it on. But basically, this is um, just a back end program that's going to um, let you uh, build a Linux web server that's specifically designed to host shiny apps. And I don't have any experience with this, but I know our other co-organizer, um, Janani has looked into this or has uh, built her own um, shiny server. So uh, it's definitely doable. You just then turn into the maintainer um, of your server instead of shiny. But then again, you're allowed to put as much data on there as you want and host as many apps as you want, um, which is um, definitely a benefit above being able to host, um, you know, only five applications with limited amounts of data. All right, so um, after listening today, you guys hopefully know how to build a, a simple Shiny app. Uh, we can create um, interactions between a user interface and um, the server so that we can go back and forth and uh, make new plots with new input. And uh, I've showed you that it's you know relatively straightforward to get our apps um, online as long as they you don't have too many of them and you don't want to spend money and um, uh, you don't have too much too much data. But I mean, for um, smaller projects where the um, you know the input data isn't um, as large, or some situation where you wanted to use an API to um, scrape data from the web on the fly, I think you could probably get away um, with a lot just by using the free version of Shiny.io. So I hope that that was um, informative for at least. Uh, some of you guys, and you know, hopefully, um, we'll get some speakers and some uh, other stuff um, going um, for our other seminars. We'll get some, you know, non our ladies organizers. And the other thing that I'd be really excited about um, that you know I tried to demonstrate today is that you. In order to share your new R knowledge with um, Our Ladies East Lansing, um, 
you don't have to be a super hyper expert writer of the package um, to really share your knowledge and be helpful um, and be helpful to folks. Uh, I think it's a really good exercise if there's something that you're interested in learning to, you know, wrap your head around a package, figure out the ins and outs, and then put together a little workshop based on how you learned it and, uh, you know, share it with the Our Ladies community. We love to have uh, volunteers giving workshops or talks. And if you don't want to put together um, a super long one, you know, we can get a few um, Our Ladies to make um, demos and we can do sort of lightning presentations. And I think that would be that would be great. We love interaction from the community and you definitely don't have to be an expert to be um, to be useful and to share your knowledge. So, all right. So should it only be um, a lady to be presented? So we really um, do uh, definitely email us like Janani is saying, if you're interested in co-leading uh, any meetups or hosting speakers. We definitely want to give um, priority to um, to women and gender minorities and um, underrepresented folks in data science for um, leading workshops and giving presentations. Uh, that's the that's the uh, mission of our ladies to uh, give a safe and inclusive space for folks that you know don't often don't have as much opportunity. Um, in the in the data science space. That being said, uh, you know, give us a shout or um, you know, see if you can team up with um, some other our ladies if you want to put a workshop together, and we'd be we'd be happy to host. We have had men co-host meetups before, so yeah. Um, and uh, like Janani said, uh, there's definitely a ton of. Um, sample code even uh, within the uh, sort of Git repository that I shared from the tutorial and tons and tons more um, on the um, on the shiny website. So I mean, this is really just a starting point. So you can wrap your head around the user interface and the server and sort of how those two um, interact with each other and just how you can get something off the ground pretty quickly if you already have some code lying around. Uh, but it's definitely the very, very tip of the iceberg. There's so much cool stuff you can do. Um, and now I'm obsessed with shiny app as art. So I'll probably waste um, a lot of time putting fancy buttons and download and uploads. And it's, <laughs> it's gonna, it's, I, I can feel that a lot of my energy is going to be put into this um, for fun coming up. So hopefully you guys feel a little bit inspired. Awesome. Getting a lot of thanks. <laughs> and um, like I said, we'll keep you guys um, posted on Twitter and through emails and on the Slack channel of our um, upcoming events. And, you know, we're really excited to host some more um, social events in the um, upcoming months along with our um, seminars and talks and things like that. So um hopefully you guys can join us for those as well so we can get to know people and um uh, even in this virtual reality so does anyone have any questions that weren't um uh weren't sort of answered in the chat I have a question but not exactly related to shiny app but are there any plans to get to have that our ladies workshops back in person so this fall we don't have plans to um, be in person we're going to stay um, virtual in spring um, we're hoping to get um, back in person but we're gonna um, you know evaluate that when the when the time comes we're looking forward to getting back together in person as well okay great thanks Maybe an outdoor event when the weather is nicer, if that's all we can uh, swing. Yeah, and like um, uh, Optimus mentions in the chat, um, uh, it, one thing that's good about being virtual is that we can get folks from outside 
um, of East Lansing. So something that we're thinking about, especially when hosting speakers um, from outside of the area is having sort of hybrid um, in-person virtual seminars where maybe you know our speakers will be um, zooming in and we can all be in a room interacting with each other, which, which definitely will be nice. Uh, yeah, moving forward, I think even if we go back to in-person, we would like to offer that hybrid. So uh, MSU does have people and Grand Rapids, we have a whole campus there. So it'd be nice to always make it accessible for those people as well. And it's been really nice to, um, you know, work jointly with the Our Lady, with Our Lady Chicago. I think we've had some great um, workshops and, and talks uh, in collaboration with them. And of course, that's really only feasible with a, with a virtual component as well, so. We have a member from Japan here. So you taught all the way to Japan today, Stephanie. Oh. Well, excellent. Um, hopefully we'll get some, it's, it's great. I love having people from all over the place. I went to a couple um, Our Ladies Dallas events um, last semester and I know Janani um, hosted events all, or uh, uh, presented events all over the world last semester. So, you know, while we might not get the same sort of in-person um, interactions, it's really being online has provided some great, great opportunities. So, all right. Well, if um, nobody has any more questions, feel free to head out. If you do have questions, um, you know, you can ask them in the, in the Our Ladies channel and we'll try to, we'll try to get back to you and happy, happy shiny app um, making. And please, if you get any of your apps posted and you're really proud, send the link over to the Slack channel. We'd love to take a look. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks, everyone.